Hello, and welcome to another TMRN, Thai Monk Radio Network production. I'm McLaren, and today is Saturday, the 7th of July, 2012. Joining us today for a discussion of economics, financial markets, and financial survival is Doug Casey of Casey Research. He is a highly respected author, publisher, and professional investor who graduated from Georgetown University in 1968. Doug literally wrote the book on profiting from periods of economic turmoil in his book, Crisis Investing, and it spent multiple weeks as the number one book on the New York Times bestseller list and became the best-selling financial book of 1980. He has been a featured guest on hundreds of radio and TV shows. To learn more about Doug and his team at Casey Research, how they may be able to assist you, please point your browser to caseyresearch.com. They feature various categories of paid advisory services, but also help investors in general with articles and commentary you can read without cost or obligation. They also offer a risk-free trial of the more exclusive information in the paid services. Hello, Doug. Welcome to Time Monk Radio Roundtable. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We're very happy to have you with us. The Time Monk Radio Administrator is Fox, and today he will be doing the recording and technical support of the show. Several members of the Time Monk Radio Forum were kind enough to join us for this discussion. They include members Plain, Skyhenge, and Zepman. This interview will be available for free at timemonkradio.com, on YouTube at the Time Monk Radio channel, and at the website webbotforum.com. Are you ready to begin, Doug? Let's party on. Okay, looking forward to it. To establish a baseline for our conversation today, we'd like to begin with your perspective on where things stand, and these questions are generally clustered around the theme, from on high, looking down. Doug, it may be helpful to the listeners to begin with your perspective on the big picture and work outwards from there. How do you currently see the global economic, financial, monetary, and investment landscape? I see it as being uh, very grim, actually. Uh, And when you look at the time frame of these things, uh, it's just a question of where you want to begin. I mean... um, we could start with the founding of the U.S. We could uh, we could start with a, a lot of uh, periods along the way. Uh, let me let me put it this way. Uh, I think the peak of American civilization was probably in the mid '60s. Uh, one indication of that I was thinking of the 1959 Cadillac convertible with its uh, twin bullet hail, hail lights and so forth. It was an extravagant car. That was really when America was at its peak in the late 50s to the, to the mid-60s. And from some points of view, things have been going downhill since uh, 1971 when Nixon devalued the dollar. Uh, the average standard of living of the average American has been flat since then. And insofar as it's looked better, it's because it's been because of the huge amount of debt that people have taken on. Mortgage debt, consumer debt, uh, all kinds of debt. And uh, I would say that since about 2000, uh, the U.S. has embarked upon, certainly since, uh, certainly, since 2007, but even since 2000, we've embarked upon something I like to call uh, the Greater Depression. And I call it the Greater Depression because it's going to be much more serious, much deeper and much longer than the uh, depression, the last depression, which was 1929 to 1946. So uh, that's kind of my overview on things. Now, that doesn't mean the market's won't go radically up and down in the meantime. In fact, they may not even go down uh, because the currency supply is being inflated so boldly. But the general standard of living of people uh, has been going down for the, at least the last decade. And I believe that that, uh, that trend is going to uh, continue or even accelerate. We're a little bit like Wiley Coyote at this point, who's 
who's run off the end of the uh, plateau and is out in midair about to fall into the canyon. That's the way I look at it right now. Okay, thank you. That's a, a nice big picture. Um, hopefully we aren't looking too far down into uh, Wiley Coyote's Canyon where he'll go poof. An increasing number of voices are calling the problems systemic, solvency-based, and intractable. Without a jubilee or a significant haircut by creditors, do you agree with these positions? Why or why not? Yeah, they absolutely are intractable. And the reason I say that is because in the real world, a cause has effect and actions have consequences. And the meaning of all the debt that there is in the world, I'm talking about the $16 trillion that the U.S. government owes officially. Uh, they don't even talk about the $75 trillion extra in things like uh, Social Security and Medicare obligations and and contingent liabilities for things like uh, FDIC and uh, pension benefit guarantee and so forth. All that debt, uh, let me put it this way. When you have savings, savings are the excess of production over consumption. That's what savings is. You put that aside, that's the seed corn, that's money for a rainy day. But when you have debt, it, it, when you have savings, it means you've been living below your means, and that's how you become wealthy. But when you have debt, uh, it, it means you've been living above your means, and that means that you're either consuming capital that other people have put aside in the past, or you're mortgaging your future income. Uh, and so I, I think the amount of debt in the world, it's in the United States, but it's all over the world, China, Japan. Europe, everywhere. Uh, this is very critical. And uh, until that debt is washed away, things aren't going to get better. Now, you mentioned a jubilee, uh, which is, is that term is usually used. It's a, uh, it's a general forgiveness of debt. Now, that debt is all going to be wiped out. Uh, it's either going to be inflated out of existence with the destruction of the currency, or it's going to be defaulted on. But I don't think there's going to be anything as uh, uh, polite and structured as the Jubilee, which incidentally I don't approve of in principle, simply because it's something that, uh, that governments oppose upon society or some sectors of society, uh, the creditors as opposed to the debtors. But uh, it's a very grim situation. And I think we're just in the early stages of big problems. Okay, so uh, the classic jubilee of uh, times ancient, uh, you don't see happening uh, in terms of a decree coming down that debts are absolved. Instead, it will be inflated away or um, there will be simple defaults on the part of the debtors because they won't be able to manage the debt. That's right. And the thing to remember is that uh, when a debt is defaulted on, uh, that's somebody's liability, the debt but it's also somebody's asset. Now, in most cases, it's the asset of a bank because most of the debt today, well, a lot of the debt is, uh, is in the form of bank credit. And of course, I have no sympathy for these big banks, which are all run uh, in cahoots with uh, the government, the Federal Reserve, fractional reserve banking and so forth. So I, I have no sympathy for those people. But on the other hand, uh, if they go bust, and they'll all go bust, or they should go bust because they're all bankrupt, actually, uh, it means that the average guy who's been producing more than he's been consuming and saving the difference has generally been saving in dollars, and he puts the dollars in the bank. So if those dollars disappear, it means that the, uh, the assets of the most productive part of society are going to disappear along, along with those banks, which is, of course, why the government has been bailing them out, which is very stupid and counterproductive in my opinion, but nonetheless, they've been doing it. And it's papered things over and made things uh, since 2009, uh, 10, and 11, and this year, uh, look better than they would have otherwise. But it's only an appearance. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate that perspective. Plain now has a couple of questions for you, Doug. Plain? Uh, yeah, so these are questions from... Uh, Forum member Green Meadow. Um, economic collapse has happened in Argentina, Russia, and Iceland. 
What can we learn from what these different countries went through? Well, I think it's actually quite interesting. Uh, it's that uh, the financial collapse really uh, can be really inconvenient uh, and uh, can reduce the standard of living of the society as a whole. That's the bad news. But the good news is that the real wealth, or most of the real wealth in the world, and certainly in those three countries you just mentioned, uh, continues to exist. In other words, the uh, uh, the buildings, the uh, uh, the skills that people have, the technologies, uh, the factories, uh, they don't uh, collapse just because the financial system collapses. So uh, it's a good news, bad news kind of thing. Uh, I'm not pred- when I'm predicting a financial collapse. I'm not necessarily predicting the end of the world at all. And those, each of those three countries, Argentina, Russia, Island, uh, Iceland, are, are perfect examples of, uh, of the way this can come down. It just means a severe uh, decrease in the standard of living of the average person. And if he's smart, uh, after he's smacked upside the back of the head by a financial collapse and losing all his financial assets, uh, he'll dig in, uh, start producing and saving again, and uh, in an amazingly short period of time, the economy, if it's relatively free, uh, can make a comeback. I mean, look at Germany after World War II, Japan after World War II. Uh, it wasn't just a financial collapse. Uh, they were totally destroyed. And still, within a generation, they came back to be uh, among the very most prosperous countries in the world. So... Uh, You've got to look at the bright side. Well, what about on a more of a uh, big picture view? That's on the individual level that people can come back. Um, do you think that there are some policy lessons to be learned? I mean, what Argentina did as opposed to what Iceland did or something like that? Yeah, sure. The, the policy lesson, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is that uh, a government as an entity is a predator on society. Uh, and in a modern, industrialized, uh, high-tech society, government is not, not important. It, it, it's, it, it's increasingly redundant. Uh, it's uh, increasingly just a dead hand on society. I mean, the levels of prosperity that I think the world would, would, have, would be achieving now, if it wasn't for the huge amounts of regulation the government places upon things, the the taxes which suck capital out of the productive part of society and misallocate it, uh, the destruction of the currency uh, that, uh, of course, governments all over the world are responsible for. So the answer to the question is this. It's that the, the problems that we're facing today are, are 100% uh, a result of government intervention in the economy in many, many ways, and the recovery uh, will, will be much stronger and much faster if the government disengages. And, of course, these governments are doing just exactly the opposite of that. So they're not doing just the wrong thing. They're doing exactly the opposite of the right thing, which is why uh, I, I, I'm, I'm quite bearish. Well, you're not the only one. <laughs> okay, I've got another question from uh, member Green Meadow. The derivative shadow market appears larger than ever larger even than the real economy of the globe by many times. What consequences do you see for the real economy caused by these derivatives? Well, in principle, I see nothing wrong with uh, derivatives. Uh, I mean, they can be quite simple, like selling calls or selling puts against stocks or commodities. Or for for that matter, commodity futures contracts themselves are, are, are a derivative so I have no philosophical problem with, with derivatives in and of themselves. Uh, the problem, it seems to me, is the size of the financial industry as a whole. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's far, far uh, too large a portion of uh, all the activity in the world today. Uh, when, when kids go to college today, which is another thing which I think is generally a misallocation of both uh, time and money, uh, they're, they're generally get trying to, still trying to be MBAs and so forth. Uh, I, I think the numbers are that something like 20% of the U.S. economy is financial-related. 
and this is crazy because uh, the, the financial business doesn't produce anything at all. This is a lot of pointless paper, paper, paper shuffling going on. And uh, the huge amount of derivatives in the world today, which, of course, Warren Buffett has referred to them as uh, instruments of, of mass uh, destruction, he's, he's quite correct. Because in each of these things, when you have a derivative, you think you have an asset of whatever complex type, but there's a counterparty. And in a highly leveraged world that we are in today, uh, you can't trust your counterparty. So if the counterparty goes bust, you go bust too. And then somebody that's doing business with you can go bust. This is the problem with leverage and with debt. So the answer to the question is uh, the financial sector of the world economy is way, way too big, and it's riding for a fall. Okay, thanks. And I'd like to bring Skyhenge into our conversation now, Doug. Skyhenge, you're up. Thanks, Mac. Okay, Doug, if the free market theory is so evidently true, then why does most of the world continue to labor under a half-capitalist, half-socialist economy? Uh, I would say uh, we have to use Occam's razor here. And Occam's razor, one thing it indicates is that the simplest answer is usually the best answer. And I think it boils down to stupidity. Uh, but we have to define the word stupidity also. I'm not using it as a pejorative. I'm using it as a technical term. And let me define stupidity as an unwitting tendency to self-destruction. So uh, there are all these uh, economic theories which have been floated, in a, especially in the last 150 years, uh, various strains of Marxism and socialism and communism and uh, all kinds of things. I forget what Christina uh, Kirchner Fernandez calls calls her theory, uh, such as it is in Argentina. Uh, so uh, there is no good uh, reason for it, except uh, the psychological aberrations uh, which are in the minds of the average person. So uh, that's that's really the only thing I can I can say in answer. It, it, it makes it makes no sense, but the human human beings as a species constantly do things that make no sense. It's unfortunate. So we should never attribute to malice what stupidity. Well, look, we can contribute a lot of it to. Uh, Stupidity, but then we can contribute. We can attribute some of it to actual evil. Uh, I, if we, I, I like to look at what people do uh, and apply Pareto's law, which is the 80-20 principle. And my view of it, there are many, many applications of Pareto's law, but from this point of view, I would say 80% of human beings are basically decent, good, get-along, go-along types. 20% of them are problematical. And you take 20% of that 20% and you're dealing with bad actors. And you take 20% of that 20%, you're dealing with active, uh, hostile, aggressive sociopaths, psychopaths. And the problem is, is that that's exactly the type of person that tends to go into government. The reason they tend to go into government is because government is institutionalized coercion which naturally draws psychopaths. And at this point, I, I think most of the governments of the world have been taken over by, by this class of people. So I don't see any, uh, any, any chance for a turnaround until this present system is washed away. I'm sorry to be so gloomy, but uh, that's my case. And I think it's, it may or may not be correct, but I think it's at least logical. Well, I couldn't agree more. Uh, thank you very much, Doug. And we'd like to bring Zepp Mann also into our discussion here. Zepp? Yeah, all right. Thanks, Mac. Hi, uh, hi, Doug. Yeah. Um, hi, actually, I've got a uh, hi. I've got a question about uh, government as well. In fact, uh, and it's this: Why do so many people believe that holding government debt is good? I mean, governments have a nasty habit of never actually paying it back one way or another. So it's hardly quality, is it? 
yeah, I totally disapprove of government debt because the only way a government can repay that debt is by extracting it forcibly from the people under its control, its, uh, its citizenry, its, its subjects. So uh, eventually, people that own government debt all over the world are going to wind up holding an empty bag. And frankly, I have no sympathy for them, because by lending money to the government, they've made it possible for the government to support itself and, uh, and to perform all the depredations that governments uh, uh, impose uh, upon the world. Uh, incidentally, I advocate, and I know this is going to sound outlandish to listeners, but nonetheless I advocate it, that government debt should be defaulted on. And why do I say that? First of all, because if that government debt is ever going to be repaid, it's going to be repaid by future generations, many of them yet unborn. You know, people's children and their grandchildren are going to be turned into veritable serfs or indentured servants paying that debt off. And this is completely unjust uh, that, uh, that they be forced to pay off debt incurred by their seniors. So from an ethical point of view, government debt should be defaulted on. Second reason it should be defaulted on uh, is, is to punish the people that have lent the government money, uh, which I think is immoral to do, uh, although it's convenient because it's a big liquid market. Uh, and a third reason is government, I'd like to see governments default on their debt is it'll ruin, ruin their credit for a good long period of time and make it impossible for them to borrow and, and therefore do all the stupid and uh, counterproductive and evil things that they usually do with that money. So that kind of sums up my feeling on government debt. Well, I agree. And sort of really as a supplemental question there, do you think there's a chance of people actually or some of these institutions actually you know, calling them on that and actually defaulting on that? Do I think the, the government actually, actually will default? Well, yeah, or they will default, or the other side, that they'll call the debt in. Because what tends to happen with government debt is it's never actually repaid. It's always just rolled over and rolled over and rolled over and rolled over. Yeah, well, it can only be rolled over if people are willing to buy the next series of debt. So I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, I spend a lot of time in Argentina, and mm -hmm. uh, I've become familiar with the place. And the governments down there are almost uniformly... Uh, uh, they're almost uh, case studies of uh, incompetence and dishonesty. They're, they're just despicable. But uh, 10 years ago, I was actually very pleased when Argentina defaulted on its debt and punished all the idiots uh, who'd financed, uh, financed them by lending money. So I, I expect that that's going to happen other places in the world. Well, it's certainly been uh, the situation in Iceland because they've defaulted, um, but that's what, I guess they're quite a small economy, and uh, although a lot of people went after them, it, it didn't really matter too much. Um, I just wonder if one of the bigger sovereign debts will then default. That would be an interesting question. Well, I, I, I wouldn't doubt it'll happen. And in Iceland, incidentally, uh, I, I was glad to see the, uh, uh, the way that worked as I understand it, and I'm not 100% up to speed on Iceland, is that... Uh, uh, the uh, foreigners, uh, most of them British, I think, wanted to see the Iceland government stand in back of these Iceland banks, which were selling uh, high-yielding CDs to the Brits. So I'm glad the government didn't step in and back it up. I mean, it was good. You know, you, 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 you lend money to, to, a, to a bank, well, why should you expect the taxpayers of that country to bail you out if the bank is improperly managed and goes bust? Absolutely. Yeah, great answer. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Overarching the financial and economic system is today what passes for money and credit, the firmament of fiat if you will. Our discussion and conversation will now shift to take a look at this unstable overhead. And first up on this topic is our friend Skyhenge. Skyhenge? Doug, this question is from Green Meadow. There is a speculation that Germany might take the euro, leaving the southern euro states to fend for themselves. Then Germany will back the euro with gold. 
Russia, China, and the Middle East are waiting for Germany's move. And when it moves, they will drop the dollar and trade in their own gold-backed currencies. Do you think this is a feasible theory? Well, I think in the long run, that's the only thing that can happen that will work. Uh, I'm of the opinion that uh, eventually uh, the world is going to go back to gold, not because there's any magic uh, about it, but simply because gold is, uh, there's a reason why through thousands of years of history, gold has always been used as money. Uh, it's not because of any government fiat, it's simply because gold is Aristotle, well, he didn't say gold, but he said a good money has five characteristics. It's durable, divisible, convenient, consistent, and it has value of itself. And of all the 92 naturally occurring elements, gold suits those things better than any other. It's convenient. That's why we don't use lead as money. It takes too much of it. Uh, it's consistent. Um, that's why we don't use real estate as money, because one piece, every piece is different from every other piece. It's durable. That's why we don't use wheat as money, because it rots, or oil for that matter. Uh, durable, divisible, convenient, consistent, and it has value in and of itself. It's usable. Nobody gets stuck with it. That's why we don't use paper as money. And the, 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 the thing, the, the euros, the yens, the dollars, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't meet these five criteria uh, of money. Somebody can get holding the bag with them and, and will be uh, left holding the bag with them. So do I think that the Germans are going to back the euro with gold? Well, first of all, it makes no sense for these different countries, which the governments manage their economies differently, have different spending patterns, taxation patterns, different cultures. The only way they can use a common money is if they use gold, which is exactly what everybody in the world did uh, in the 19th century. And that's one reason why the 19th century was so peaceful, uh, far more peaceful than any other century before or since, and so prosperous. And uh, there was so, many, so much ground gain. So actually, none of these countries should have their own currencies. Uh, they should just use gold. I mean, people forget that during the 19th century, uh, the mark and the lira and the dollar and the pound and all these things, they were just names for specific amounts of gold within that culture, within, uh, within that uh, bailiwick of a certain government. Uh, and so they were all interchangeable uh, with each other under the gold coin standard. Uh, so I think that's going to happen again. It, it's, uh, it, it's a back to the future thing, and it's necessary. And if you'll recall, about 10 years ago, uh, Mohammed Mahathir, who was the, uh, who's the, at the time the prime minister of Malaysia, uh, who I'm not generally a fan of, but nonetheless, he came up with one interesting idea. He pointed out that the Koran uh, designates only two things as being usable for money, uh, a certain amount of gold, about the size of a, of a grain of, 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 of wheat, I think it is, uh, the, the, um, the uh, dirham and the, uh, slipping my mind at this point, but one's gold, one's silver. Uh, and he tried to get that going among Islamic uh, governments. But, of course, uh, they're all run by criminals, especially those Islamic governments. So they, they, it was a good idea, but it, it, it's a straw in the wind. So I, I think it's going to happen. Yes, it is going to happen, but not exactly in the way you say. It's not the Germans back in the euro. If the Germans have a currency, it'll be a gold mark again, because they can't have a euro, because the French would be in it and other countries. Uh, it, it, the, euro, the euro is going to wind up uh, reaching its intrinsic value, which is zero. Like all fiat currencies. Yes, like all fiat currencies. Well, one thing I find curious is, um, you know, everyone talks about gold, but here you're calling from a country that's named after silver. The name for silver is the same as the name for money in many countries, and the Constitution even says silver is the amount of a dollar. So I'm just curious, when you say gold, does that mean silver and gold? Well, a bimetallic standard 
doesn't work when a government enforces a fixed rate between gold and silver because uh, they're commodities and they fluctuate in value relative to each other just like iron fluctuates in value relative to wheat so you can't fix the value between gold and silver that uh, that that cannot work but there's no reason why uh uh, things can't be priced in both gold and silver, or for that matter, priced in copper or uh, anything else that suits his money. It's up to the merchant, it's up to the buyer and the seller. It's just a medium of exchange. Okay, great. Thanks, Doug. Doug, as uh, we continue to look at this fiat world, one of the continuing panaceas that the central banking policymakers keep offering is so-called liquidity. Um, in your view, can liquidity resolve the problems as you understand them? No, because the only way these people can create liquidity is by creating more currency units. Uh, so, you know, it's funny how they destroy the value of words as well as everything else they touch. Uh, everybody recognizes that, hey, liquidity, that's a good thing. I want more liquidity. But the way that they propose getting liquidity is by creating more of their uh, fiat currency units, which just destroys the value of each one of those currency units. Uh, from that point of view, Zimbabwe had fantastic li liquidity a few years ago. Sure so, did. So liquidity is good, but not the way they use the word. Okay. Um, well, they keep building these bridges of liquidity across this chasm of debt deflation, if you will, and they're hoping to somehow build this bridge to a new economic foundation. How do you see that that might eventually stop? What's going to be the thing that causes the liquidity suspension bridge to break over the chasm of debt default and debt deflation? Well, I'll tell you what I think is going to happen. Uh, the world's central banks, and unfortunately just about every country in the world has a central bank today that issues the currency used by that country. And so what's backing these various currencies issued by these central banks of different governments? It used to be gold, but that's a very, very minor factor today. And some countries like Canada and the UK, to name two big ones, have almost zero gold at this point. So what are the assets of the central banks other than faith? Basically, the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar itself is in huge trouble. So um, unfortunately, it's like, it's like uh, when Argentina destroys its currency, which it does every 10 years, or Brazil uh, typically destroys its currency every 10 years. Uh, it's a disaster within the country, but that's just one country. It's like when Germany destroyed its currency in 1923. It's a disaster within the country, but fortunately, uh, all the other countries around it uh, are able to, people in the other countries around it are able to jump in and take advantage of bargains and, 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 and bring specie back into the country so commerce can be conducted. The problem this time around is that since all these currencies everywhere in the world are the assets of the central banks are mainly U.S. dollars, not entirely, but mainly U.S. dollars, if the U.S. government succeeds in destroying the dollar, it's going to destroy all these other currencies, which are incidentally, they're printing up trillions of them too. So we're not just looking at a disaster for one single country. Uh, as we've seen in Zimbabwe or Germany or Argentina or, or Yugoslavia not so long ago, this is going to be almost a worldwide thing. It's, it's, it's going to be a real catastrophe from that point of view. Yeah, no, it, it certainly has me worried, Doug. 
kind of on a parallel topic, there's uh, coming out of certain circles of economic academia and others, other considerations for fiat currencies, something that is uh, a purely fiat item that would not put us back onto a commodity linked or commodity based money, something that's called the modern monetary theory. Have you heard of that at all? Oh, I'm sure it's just another cockamamie scheme. The thing to remember, in my opinion, is that government shouldn't be involved in money any more than it should be involved in uh, supplying food for everybody, uh, or for that matter, medical care, or supplying cars, or, or roads. I mean, the government's all over the world have taken it upon themselves to do all kinds of things that have nothing to do with the basic function of government, which I see is just protecting you from coercion. Because since government is pure of coercion, it should, and coercion is a bad thing, uh, the functions of government should be limited to protecting you from coercion. It po implies a, a police force, an army, and a, a court system. It certainly shouldn't be involved in the monetary system. So whatever this thing is that you're mentioning, it's just another cockamamie scheme where they're going to try some new jury-rigged system, which is completely unnecessary. The market can and should determine what money is. It has nothing to do with the government. Okay. No, I agree with you entirely. I uh, was just kind of curious if you had heard of MMT, but since you haven't, um, we don't need to go into it. Would you? I, I haven't, but I'm, I'm absolutely sure it's, it, 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 it's another scheme for, for, for central banks. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. Um, so you would be an advocate of, say, uh, Ron Paul's competing currencies um, legislation that's currently pending inside the United States Congress? Oh, I think that would be a big step in the right direction, yes. Okay, terrific. Well, I'm going to uh, let Zepp Mann pose a, another question or two here for you. Zepp? Yeah, thanks a lot for that one, Mac. Yeah. Um, Doug? What do you say to those who say that the euro was designed from the outset to withstand the dollar collapse? And considering the talk that we hear about the euro, is it really just masking the actual problem, which is the U.S. dollar? No, I think the U. I think the if the U.S. dollar is an IOU nothing, which it is on the part of a bankrupt government, the U.S. government, then the euro is a who owes you nothing. Because all those European governments are even more bankrupt than the U.S. government is, and and the euro is 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 is, is like a currency by committee, where where none of the committee members can agree, and they all have different interests and so forth. So, the euro is going to be the first of the world currencies to uh, reach its intrinsic value. There's zero hope for the euro. I think as a supplement to that, um, if you look at the uh, ECB's uh, balance sheet on the first line, they actually list gold as one of the assets of the bank. Um, no other central bank in the world does that. The Bank of England certainly doesn't. The Federal Reserve in the U.S. certainly doesn't. Only, only the European Central Bank for the euro does. And it's, it's now up to about 60-odd percent of the value. So it's actually risen in value because they, they mark to market the gold value all the time. Hmm. Well, that's, that's very good. So uh, how many ounces of gold does the European Central Bank own at this time? Well, the European Central Bank, as I understand it, has a call on all the other countries' gold, which is X amount of thousands of tons or whatever it is, all the member countries in the euro. Um, and that's essentially what props it up. Well, my guess is, I don't know, we'd have to add up what all these governments, the, the Brits have almost no gold at this point. Uh, the French, the, uh, the Italians have a good amount, the Germans have a good amount. But I think if you added all that gold together, the U.S. government owns about 265 million ounces of gold. Uh, I'll just guess wildly that the, uh, all, the, all the euro uh, countries together probably have about uh, 350 million ounces of gold. Okay, so uh, 
if we divide that into the uh, money supply, uh, I don't know what the what the ostensible money supply of euros is. Right. An ounce of gold would stand in back of each euro. But uh, I don't have any hope for the euro because when when they're printing up euros or finding euros someplace like Bela Greece, which is the current problem country, but they're all problem countries. All, all, all these countries are basically in the same position as, as Greece is, quite frankly. Uh, they're printing up money to, to give, lend the Greek government, give it even more debt than it has now, so it can t- continue paying out the outrageous benefits that it's paying to government employees and, uh, and others in Greece. So uh, based on that, they're not going to change that. So I, I, I just, I, I don't see hope for the euro. It's going to fall apart. Okay. And, and all these countries, if they have gold, uh, I, don't, I don't see the Germans or, or anybody else giving all of their gold to the central bank so it can be frittered away to bail out uh, countries that are more profligate. They're not going to do it. No, I agree. I don't think the Germans will do it, no. Um, and obviously, when you mentioned uh, the British situation, the British I mean, we've been, the British situation is that they're outside the euro, and uh, of course, our prime minister, or who was the uh, finance guy at the time, famously sold most of our gold about 10 years ago, and then uh, just before the price went up on it. So, uh, you know, we, we, the, we have a very small currency in the world stage as... as uh, compared to the dollar or the euro, and we're completely unbacked. Yes. Okay, thanks for that, Doug. Thanks a lot. We are speaking with Doug Casey of Casey Research. You can learn more about his thinking and suggestions for successful investing by visiting his website, caseyresearch.com. At the website, you can review writings by the Casey Research team and subscribe to their publications. Doug, is there anything you'd like to add about material that's available at your website? Well, there is one thing that might interest current listeners if they want to hear more of this particular uh, take on reality. It's that most Wednesdays I do uh, something called Conversations with Casey where um, Louis James, who's our, uh, who's a very sound guy, but one of the hats he wears is he's a mining analyst. Uh, and we talk about everything under the sun. And that's a completely free publication. So if you go on Casey Research, you can easily find conversations with Casey and just sign up for it. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. Okay, terrific. Thanks very much, Doug. Look forward to listening to or reading you and your analyst on Wednesdays. Thanks. Turning now to the historic bedrock of money, we'd like to explore your real views on gold and silver as safe havens and assets, Doug. And Zepman will be leading off our questions for this topic. Zepman? Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, Doug, recently the uh, Basel Committee for Bank Supervision, the uh, FDIC and other regulators announced that gold bullion is up for consideration as a tier one asset and equal to government debt with zero risk weighting. What's your view on this? Well, I I think it's uh, uh, admirable common sense uh, on the part of these people. Uh, So I I think that it's a a straw in the wind that uh, uh, they're moving in a direction of, uh, of, uh, once again, reinstituting gold as uh, international money. So I, I see that as a... Uh, a normal, natural uh, uh, thing that, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, like I said before, I mean, Aristotle defined the five reasons why, uh, the five characteristics of any good money, and uh, gold uh, suits better than any other single money. So, of course. So, um, and also, based on what we said before about sort of government debt, I mean, if, if uh, an investor or somebody was to consider either government debt or gold, if they have, you know, an equal standing, if you like, I mean, do you see that money perhaps will flow out of government debt and into gold bullion? Well, certainly at these interest rates that we have right now, I mean, uh, uh, these central banks of uh, all over the world have... Uh, done their best to depress interest rates 
to uh, ridiculous and unsustainable levels. We're talking about a, a quarter of a percent, a half a percent, one percent, maybe two percent if you go out far enough on, on the uh, yield uh, curve. So that uh, at this point, uh, owning government debt is it's it's not a it's not a, uh, a you don't get risk free yield you get uh, uh, yield free risk and uh, this is one reason why I think that the price of gold in terms of paper currencies is still in a bull market and is heading up now eventually you know as these governments really uh, destroy their currencies interest rates are going to go much higher people forget that uh, during the late 70s and early 80s, we were talking about interest rates all over the world, 12, 15 percent, even 20 percent. And uh, this time around, there's a potential for those rates to go even higher. So it's a question of when they do. But when they do, of course, that'll that'll put some kind of a uh, a support uh, under these paper currencies. Uh, but it's a question of nominal interest rates and real interest rates, too. Right now, anybody that's holding on to any currency in the world is basically getting something like minus 5% in real interest rates. So I hate to predict what real interest rates are going to be in the future, but right now they're, they're, they're negative, and um, currencies are depreciating rapidly. Yeah, that's certainly the case. And in fact, with the euro uh, just reducing their rates just the other day as well, I mean, that's, uh, or Euroland reducing their rates, that uh, is not a very, very good sign for the marketplace, is it? No, it's not. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, bankrupting the prudent people that are saving in these currencies, and it's encouraging people to take on even more debt. So it's, uh, they're doing exactly the opposite of what they should be doing. But if you look at just say the M2 value of money recently, I mean, just looking at the uh, St. Louis Fed's chart at the moment, the the velocity of money is down so far. It's actually picking up on what have you said earlier on about some of the best times in America in the late 50s and early 60s. Well, the velocity of money is back down to that level now. We, you know, there, there is no movement on the money at all. And if they if they keep the interest rates very low or even lower them again you know to zero or even negative interest rates i mean the big capital and big money has to go somewhere so could you see some of that moving into physical gold even absolutely i think that's going to continue and, and you're seeing that with uh, especially oddly enough these third world countries seem to be consistent buyers uh, of gold the russians the chinese the indians uh lots of uh koreans uh so all these other countries uh, around the world that are buying gold, and I only can presume it's because they realize that they're holding the hot potato currencies of uh, uh, the Euro bloc and uh, the U.S. And uh, they may not be uh, terribly smart when it comes to economics, but they're not stupid enough to realize to uh, to, to want to hold on to a uh, to a a fiat debt of a bankrupt government, which is why they're trading their dollars for gold as quickly as they can, I think. Yeah, I agree. I think that's also the uh, the difference between the sort of Eastern and the Western mentality regarding metals and paper. One, in the West, we seem to prize paper over metal, and in the East, they seem to prize metal over paper. Yes, I agree. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Doc. Thank you. Okay, and now we're going to turn to Skyhenge, and she'll be offering you two more questions for your answers, Doug. Skyhenge? Thanks, Zach. This question is also from Green Meadow. A number of countries, uh, notably China and Russia, seem to be stocking up on gold. As the global economic problems unfold, what will be the different outcomes for gold-holding countries versus countries that do not have much gold? Well, I think it's going to be a big problem for those places that don't have the gold. But I think we ought to make a distinction here between the country and the government of that country. Uh, it's uh, something that people do a lot, but it's improper to conflate a country with its government. Like um, the Indians, for instance, 
as individuals, they love to buy gold, and they buy a bunch of it. And the Indian government, which is a separate thing, uh, also buys gold. But at this point, right now, they've got a tax uh, on, uh, that uh, is making it uh, more expensive for their citizens to buy gold, even though their central bank is buying it. But um, the winners of this thing, are going to, I think, are going to be the ones that get rid of their paper currencies for real assets. And <clears throat> gold is one of them. But uh, there are lots of real assets, productive businesses, productive farmland. Uh, all these things are, are, are worthwhile holdings at this point. It's just a question of what you pay for them. Okay, so you, I, I really like the distinction you made between what the people of the country are holding and what the, the government of the country is holding. So the governments that were holding more gold would be more likely to continue on. Would that be a reasonable assumption? Yes, I think it, I think it would be. But let me add on to that that uh, I think that uh, the nation-state system uh, in the world is on its way out. Uh, in other words, I, I think these aggregations that are called countries now, places like, uh, like Spain and the UK and the US and China, uh, they're, uh, as forms of political organization, I, su I suspect that in a hundred years, most of them won't exist. They'll be replaced by other ways of organizing. I mean, the world has gone from, uh, in primeval times, living with tribes, where your obligation was to people that you shared a common genetic ancestor with. And then uh, kingdoms and empires took over, and you were obligated to, to the uh, prince that ruled your, um, your area of geography. And then starting in the 1600s, it was nation-states. And I think that's going out. Uh, I, I think that um, I think they're dead ducks at this point. Uh, I think a lot of people feel the way I do. Uh, I have a lot more in common with friends of mine in the Congo that I don't share language or race or or, or, or religion or cultural background with. But I feel closer to those people than I do with a lot of my fellow Americans that live down the street here in Aspen in a trailer park. Uh, the Congolese guys I share values with, and they're not liabilities to me, to me the way the, uh, most of my fellow Americans are. So um, this whole idea of identifying yourself by nationality is ridiculous. All it means is that some government has given you a piece of uh, ID called a passport, and, and you're obligated to fight in their wars and give them money for taxes. I think the whole idea is ridiculous. I agree. One other thing that's, um, well, you mentioned that the United States supposedly is holding 665 million ounces of gold no, as compared to... 265 million, more or less. Oh, okay. I, I, I misunderstood that. Uh, still, compared to the rest of Europe, you said is around 350 million ounces. I'm guessing. I haven't added up the number for the European Union countries. Okay, well, one thing I'm curious about is the Federal Reserve has not been audited. The Fort Knox hasn't been audited in many years. I've heard like around 50 years. I'm not, I don't know what the exact numbers are. What if, what if when Fort Knox does get audited, if it ever does, it's found that there isn't that much gold? How much will that affect? What if there's no gold even? Well, how will that affect the American economy? Well, that will be a major scandal, won't it? Uh, oh, do you remember yeah. that? Uh, do you remember the, um, the Ian Fleming novel Goldfinger, which was made into a movie with Sean Connery, and it was about uh, basically the uh, he had the uh, Chinese government letting off uh, a nuke in Fort Knox, so the U.S. gold would cease to exist. So maybe uh. that's the case. I mean, I don't know. It it it'll be a it'll be a disaster for the U.S. government, but not really for the people. Well, listen, the the American people are in for a disaster anyway. They're all counting on the government to pay their Medicare. They're counting on it to pay their Medicaid, their Social Security, uh, and, and all these other things. Uh, they're not going to get any of this stuff uh, because the U.S. government doesn't have 
doesn't have the financial firepower to supply these things anymore, or won't in the near future. So the Americans are already in for a uh, for a disaster anyway. Just because the U.S. government owns that gold doesn't mean it's going to do any good for the U.S. people. I mean, maybe the U.S. government would use that gold for something really destructive and stupid. Maybe it's better that the U.S. government doesn't own any gold. If I if I was in charge of the U.S. government, I would distribute it. Well, I wish you were in charge. <laughs> Very well, um, nobody, that, should, that makes be in, a lot nobody of should be in charge. That's the whole idea of a free market. Is there any place on earth where there actually is a free market? No, I can't think of any place. Uh, there are places, uh, I mean, I hate to use Singapore as an example, but um, it's a sorry state of nation states today. At least that's, it's well run. The government has a light hand. I used to hate Singapore, incidentally. Uh, I used to consider it a, I used to consider it a, uh, a, a government welfare project located next to a, next to a, an oil refinery, uh, but uh, it's improved a lot in recent years. So that's kind of a kind of a free market there. Uh, Hong Kong is actually very nice too, from that point of view. Very light hand there, but uh, places like that are few and far between. That's why I like the third world, because uh, although the governments in the third world are generally just instruments for theft, uh, generally they leave you alone, if only because they're incompetent. Certainly they leave you alone if you're not a citizen of the country, uh, so they, they can't count you as their property. They can't properly count you as a milk cow, uh, because you can pick up and leave easily. So I guess the answer to the question is, no, there's no free place in the world. The best you can do is to um, not be a, a permanent residence of any place so that um, you, you, they can't get a hold of you easily. They have to leave you alone because of practicality. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense, too. Okay, my next questions there are involving silver instead of gold. Now, in your opinion, is silver a better investment than gold at this point? I think it might might be a better speculation, and the reason I say that is because it's a much, much smaller market than gold. Uh, there's much less of it in terms of value that's above ground. Um, it has more industrial uses, although the industrial uses for gold are growing. They're both high-tech metals, uh, and it's kind of a poor man's gold. So the people that think that they can't afford gold might get into silver. So the answer, my answer to the question is yes. As a speculative vehicle, I, I prefer silver. I mean, there are risks, but I, there are different things. We shouldn't say gold and silver is which they're one thing. Uh, and a lot of people often put them together, well, for good reasons, I guess. But, uh, yeah, I prefer silver. But I own more gold simply because silver is so bulky, even at $30 an ounce. It takes a lot of it to have real wealth. That's true. Now, as far as the gold-silver ratio, do you have any speculation as to what that might change to in the future? That well, it's in, historically, it's been much lower. Yeah, it has. And actually, uh, uh, I, I think the first historical computation of the gold-silver ratio, people guess, archaeologists guess, that in ancient Egypt, uh, gold was valued at about twice what silver was. And then, of course, historically in modern industrial times, it's generally been around 17 to 1, and, you know, it got up as high as about, what, 70 or 80 to 1 uh, mm -hmm. back when, sil when silver was at $4 recently. Uh, no, I don't have any particular opinion on, on that right now. It's about like asking what... Uh, what do I think the ratio, ratio between soybeans and wheat should be, or between wheat and corn? Well, right now the ratio between wheat and corn is about two to one, uh, and that's about what it's usually been. So uh, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I think that just a, just a guess for that is the silver is underpriced relative to gold right now. 
Yeah, that's what a lot of the people that study the fundamentals say. And the historic ratio is somewhere around, what, 15 or 16? I think you said 17. Yeah. And they talk about the fact that silver is less abundant above ground at this point because we use it up and throw it away, whereas gold is all saved. But below ground, silver is more abundant still, like nine times, I think, is the last thing I heard. Is that a factor for you? Yeah, you have to. Yeah, but it's a question of the economics of recovering it. And uh, what is it? It, it must be about uh, 90 percent, 85, 90 percent of the silver in the world is recovered uh, as a byproduct from other metals, mostly lead and zinc and copper. Uh, but also gold. It's a byproduct. There, there are relatively few pure silver mines in the world, relatively speaking, a few of them. So, um, I don't know. Uh, it's, it, it's hard to say. It, it's just my gut feeling that silver is cheap relative to gold, even at $30. I agree, and, and the, a lot of people say that due to the manipulation of the silver price, which they think is more extreme than the manipulation of gold, that it's kept silver mines from opening up because it's just not economically feasible to even do it. So they've completely skewed the entire market. Nobody knows what it's worth. Well, uh, yes, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, and I know there are a lot of people that think that, of course, look, Governments try to manipulate everything, the prices of everything. They manipulate the, the price of interest rates. They, they want real estate higher. They want stocks higher. They're always trying to manipulate everything. But uh, I know there's a group of people that think that the governments of the world are artificially suppressing the price of gold and silver. And, of course, it's logical that governments would want the prices of gold and silver lower. They, they don't want to hear an alarm bell ringing. Uh, when commodities are running, they want the price of all commodities lower, everything. But they can't control the price of these things. Uh, these idiots tried to control the price of gold back in, uh, 19, in the late 60s and, and early 70s, when they were much more powerful than they are today, and, and gold was much cheaper and in real terms as well as nominal terms, and they failed miserably. So, sure, they want it lower, but uh, this stuff about uh, the prices of the metals being artificial, artificially uh, 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 suppressed by the governments uh, is uh, basically tinfoil hat stuff as far as I'm concerned. And yes, I know there are some very intelligent people that believe that, but I just think they're wrong. Not saying, I'm not saying that the governments don't want these things lower, of course, but, but they want a lot of things, and they're not going to get any of them. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Doug. And our friend Zepp Man would like to uh, get in on this gold and silver question set. Zepp? Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Doug, gold has played a role for the elite central banks and the very wealthy for a very long time. Do you think silver has a role here? I mean, for example, Eric Sprott is of the opinion that it's very undervalued. What's your opinion? Well, like I said, I do think, I think he's right. I think silver is undervalued relative to gold and relative to most things. I think it's an excellent speculation at this point. But um, I don't count on the central banks of the world to uh, have anything to do with this. Uh, and I don't believe in the bimetallic standard where central banks fix the ratio of gold and silver to each other. That's always a disaster when they try to control the prices of anything. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I agree with them. Silver is underpriced, both absolutely and relative to gold. But I don't think, uh, I, I don't think it's likely to be instituted as, as a money by any country, although I'd welcome that. I'd welcome, uh, welcome any country, any nation state uh, backing their money with a specific amount of any anything, I don't care if they make it a specific amount of of, uh, of of rubidium. I mean, any element will do. It's just that any element wouldn't be a very intelligent choice. So that's all I can say about it. Yeah, I think uh, Greece, for example, there was some talk uh, that uh, wasn't it uh, the Mexican silver guy Hugo Salinas Price was uh, involved with Max Kaiser, and they were trying to get the 
the Greek government to take on silver there as a as an idea. I mean, I don't think it's it's kicked off in the way that they wanted, but uh, probably due to the education system there that yeah, people no, don't really it, understand it, silver and gold. Yeah, it'd be a nice idea. I'd like to I'd like to see silver circulate daily as money, <clears throat> or gold, or copper. But uh, mm. it, it'll happen in the future. I don't know on what basis. But the governments will resist it because, of course, if they if they do that, then it's going to eliminate the possibility of their inflating their currencies, and that's a that that's a major source of income for them. And of course, uh, Keynesian economics says that it's a way to stimulate the economy. So they don't want to do that. They well, yeah, forced to. Yeah, the uh, the rising price of metals is actually the, is 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 real. Really, the currency weakening in buying value, but insofar as you need more of it than to buy anything. So that's why I think why they're all against you know the price of metals rising, and they try and suppress it so much. Um, yeah. As a supplementary question here, are the are the uh, very wealthy that you know? Do they have any opinions on investing or preserving wealth via silver? Well, the you know the thing is is that a lot of the wealthy people that I know are involved in the the mining business or the hard money business. So they understand it and they buy things. But other wealthy people that I know that are not in in our little subculture, they don't have a clue. They don't know anything about this stuff. If anything, they listen to people like Warren Buffett, who I consider to be, although a genius investor, I consider him to be an idiot savant when it comes to economics. He doesn't understand economics at all, although he understands investing uh, as well or better than anybody in the world. So most wealthy people don't, don't have any idea about this stuff. Okay. And as a final question on silver, are there any central banks that have a silver asset base that you're aware of? Uh, no, I don't know of any. I really don't. But as you know, I think that central banks should be abolished as an institution. They serve no useful purpose. Well, no, I certainly agree with you on that. Okay, well, thanks for all those uh, answers. Thanks a lot, Doug. Yeah, okay. Doug, there have been any number of people who have thrown out their wild guesses in terms of what the price of gold might go to if the world were to climb back onto a gold standard, the world climb back onto a gold standard. Um, people like Jim Rickards um, have offered up numbers of forty or 50,000 just based upon the U.S. converting its M1 and M2 classifications to be a 50 percent reserved basis. Um, for the then circulating currency. What's your take on this? Where might gold go um, if it were 50% or even 100% reserved? Yeah, I understand. Uh, in the first place, uh, as I said before, I don't think that the government should have anything to do with the money supply, frankly. That's a market function. And sure. uh, it's not the business of the government, number one. Number two is if, in the meantime, governments did uh, start backing their money with gold uh, or silver, um, I don't believe in anything except 100% reserve, which is to say one for one. Every piece of paper you issue uh, is, is backed by a specific gold coin. Uh, I don't believe in 50% reserve. That just means you're going to get into trouble eventually. Yeah. So... It's just a question of doing the arithmetic. And um, in the case of uh, the U.S. government, they have 265 million reported ounces of gold. So then we have to do some division into the money supply. How much is M1, M M3, which they don't count anymore? Uh, so what would the number be there? Well, you know, it's funny because I think, who was it, Greenspan or Bernanke, when he was asked, what actually is the money supply? He said, well, we really don't know. And that's true. They really don't know at this point. Yep. And it, it fluctuates a lot with uh, how they expand the reserves of the banks and so forth. Uh, look at it this way. Uh, there are probably about $7 trillion U.S. dollars that are outside the United States that are owned by foreigners. 
So we do some quick rough division, and we come up with, uh, let's see, 265 million, 265 billion, 1,000 an ounce. Oh, my God, right there. Uh, with seven, just to redeem dollars to foreigners that own them, uh, you're talking thousands of dollars, many thousands of dollars. What is that? 265, that's seven, well, I don't know, $30,000 an ounce. Uh, the, the, the the deficit of the rate at which the U.S. government is uh, the U.S. is shipping is shipping dollars abroad is still about a 500 billion dollar per year uh, trade deficit. So just to cover one year's trade deficit in gold, you're talking about two thousand dollars per ounce. So um, it's very hard to 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 tell what the number is, but I'm confident it's much higher than where gold is currently trading at 1600 or whatever. Yeah, no, every wise person, I don't want to use the term pundit, but every wise person who's ever done the arithmetic keeps coming up with various numbers between twenty five and $50,000 an ounce. So just yeah, wanted to get your perspective on that. No, I wouldn't argue. I wouldn't argue with any of that. The only X factor in this thing is in the meantime, we might have a deflation where, uh, where trillions of these dollars are wiped out. They, they just go poof. They're defaulted yeah. on with uh, bond defaults, uh, bank failures if the government doesn't create more to bail the banks out. So it's, it's hard to say, but I, uh, I, buy, I buy gold every month. I really do. Yeah, the debt as money paradigm has really taken us down a very strange path, which kind of actually leads us into our next topic area, which is that instability, what we're living through in all kinds of market areas today, instability creates opportunities. It's uh, uh, an area that your book pretty much covered. So with all with that as kind of a background, what we've been talking about so far – we hope that you can help all of our listeners with some insights. And the first set of questions, two questions, will be coming from Plain. Plain? Yes, Doug. Got a question from Green Meadow again. In unstable economic times, there are two groups of people, those with assets to preserve and those with livelihoods to preserve. What are some of the different strategies for those two populations in hard times? Mm, yes. Well, as far as people with assets to preserve, I think the most critical thing you have to do is you have to diversify internationally because your biggest risk today is not a market risk, which is there's plenty of market risk. There's lots of market risk. Uh, but uh, an even bigger risk is political risk, what your government is going to do to you. And uh, if you're a citizen of any country, your government treats you as a national asset. It treats you as a milk cow. And if things get really tough, they'll treat you as a beef cow if they have to. So it's critical that you diversify so that most of your assets are in a different political jurisdiction. And uh, that's number one. So that's what I would do if I was a person uh, with assets. Uh, but with a person that has skills but not necessarily too many assets – uh, once again, I think you have to treat the world as your oyster. Uh, if I was a person living in a third world country like Kazakhstan or Nigeria, someplace like that, I would definitely look to move to the United States, which still which has more wealth and more freedom than those countries do. That would improve my situation. But as an American... I would try to move to Kazakhstan or Nigeria. I would go the opposite direction. Why is that? Because as an American, I've got a unique set of skill, or you can say a Brit or an Australian or somebody from an advanced country. You've got a unique set of skills and experiences, and you've got more capital. You've got connections, uh, which are very valuable, that if you stay in your home country, in a home advanced Western country, you're just one of hundreds of millions of people that have those same skills and assets. So you're just one of a huge group. I think you're wiser, just like I mentioned the guy from Nigeria or Kazakhstan should 
go to the U.S. or Australia, for instance, where he's unique and he's improving the situation, the guy from the advanced countries should go in the opposite direction, where if he goes to those countries, he's unique. Uh, he's got things that nobody else does, and he can parlay them. So it's, it's, re, it's an arbitrage that works both ways. And that's true of whether you're talking about assets or the person. Well, that's a, a pretty dramatic jump for most people. Um, yeah, I know, but most people have a medieval surf mentality. So most people just flow with the river, and when there's a flood, they get washed away. And I'm very sorry for them, but I'm, I, I think the advice I'm giving them is to take the red pill. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. By the way, if you were significantly younger, how would you approach today's environment? Uh, would you do that? Would you move to Kazakhstan? Yeah, sure I would, absolutely. But I'm, you know, I, I've, I've diversified, I've followed my own advice, but, you know, I'm... I'm lazy and soft enough at this point that I don't want to go to Kazakhstan. I've been there several times. Uh, so I, I prefer, you know, I prefer living. My, my favorite places are uh, the Orient and South America. Uh, and, and that's where I spend most of my time. I mean, I go a lot of places still. Well, you're but, a man after my own heart. Those are two nice places. Yeah, they really are. They really are. Uh, you know, if I was, you know, if I was still in my twenties or thirties, uh, I would really look to Africa. It's a very screwed up place, but, uh, there's lots of distortions in the marketplaces and, uh, there's a lot of money to be made in Africa, I think. So I, I think I would put that first on my shopping list, but at this point I'm more interested in luxury than adventure. So, uh, Africa is not on my dance card, but I recommend it. Well, okay, but let's get into the next question here, which is we seem to be entering an era of chaos. So where do you recommend that one sit out this turmoil? And well, what if one has limited or somewhat limited assets or connections? Yeah, that's a problem, isn't it? Um, well, if, if, if you're going to stay, if you're an American, and you're going to stay in America, uh, I like... Uh, I, I don't have anything to do with that free state movement located in New Hampshire. And it might be one-stop shopping for the bad guys to just round up all the uh, usual suspects as times get tough. But that might not be bad. Oh, the weather in New Hampshire sucks six months of the year. Uh, boy, that's a tough question. I like to be around uh, good people. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, be around people that uh, think the same way that you do, that are honest, reliable. So that's the key. Uh, I'm not sure I'd want to. I'm, I'm talking to you right now in Aspen. I live in Aspen when I'm in North America, which is less and less these days. But uh, I wouldn't want to stay here in Aspen. It's the winter half of the year, and uh, this place draws entirely the wrong kind of people at this point. Now, you know, 30 years ago when I moved here, it was a little bit different, a little bit better, I think. But I don't know where to go. Like, I've, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in Argentina, which from some points of view is an idiotic choice because the current government there is criminally insane. Uh, that's the bad news. But the good news is they've been through going through this stuff since the days of Juan Perón, and it's still a nice place to hang out, especially if you're in the country uh, where I am. So, and governments come and go. So, um, that's a tough question to answer. It's, uh, it's a small world, but it's, it's also a big world. Well, I think there's kind of a, an implicit part to this question, though, is it, the turmoil part. I mean, New Zealand sounds great. I was there recently, and it, it really is quite lovely. But how will it fare if things get nasty on the international front? Well, you know, war in the Middle yeah. East, uh, you know, we can think of a lot of things, a dollar collapse. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Well, and so how I will Argentina wanna... or... Mm -hmm. I think Argentina is going to be okay. They're used to this kind of stuff, frankly. Uh, I think New Zealand will be okay. I, I used to be a permanent resident of New Zealand. I've, 
I used to, I went there to play polo, actually, uh, in, when did I go there? 1999, because it was about the cheapest place in the world. It was so cheap that when you left a restaurant, you felt like you should have been wearing a mask. That's how cheap it was in New Zealand in those days. And I said, I've, I've lived in New Zealand for about 10 years, uh, during the summer mostly. Uh, and I think New Zealand will be okay. Uh, it's the size of California. It's only got 4 million people. They're mostly farmers. They're really hands-on people. I think New Zealand's a good choice. Um, gee, I don't know. What do you think? Of, well, let's take a couple of others like Hong Kong or Singapore. I mean, I love Hong Kong, but, you know, the U.S.-NATO alliance is kind of building up this anti-China Cold War. Uh, at least that's what yeah, it looks no, like to me here in Asia. You're right. Uh, I, I love Hong Kong. I, I, used to, I lived in Hong Kong for years, and I liked it. Um, but especially now, I mean, when I was living in Hong Kong in the 80s, uh, it was still a very international city. Now, most of the expats have moved to Singapore, and it's really a challenge at all, because uh, I like the culture. But, um, you know, if, if you're a radically different racial group, it's hard to integrate into the society. It's not, uh, it's not like a melting pot the way the U.S. is, or for that matter, even the way Argentina is. It's a Chinese city. So it's, it can be tough if you're not Chinese. It's time to Yeah, that's, that's what it looks like to me. And I went to Singapore recently, too, and it has changed a lot. It's a lot more tolerant. <laughs> much, more, much more tolerant, yeah. I wouldn't have dreamed of living in Singapore uh, 25 years ago. But now it's, it's, it's really mellowed out. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, thanks. Thanks, Blaine. Zipman has another question for you here, Doug. Zip? Yeah, thanks a lot. Doug, you've recently suggested a strategy for the wealthy who is to become a permanent tourist. However, what do you suggest to the larger population who cannot get around the world spending money as tourists? I mean, what should they do? Well, you know, I was at uh, Anne Rand's last speech which she gave in New Orleans in 1982. And somebody from the audience asked her, but Miss Rand, what are you going to do about the poor? And her answer was, make sure you're not one of them. That was, that was the entire answer that she gave. And she went on to the next question. And I thought that was perfect. I mean, uh, somehow get enough money so you increase your, um, your flexibility. Uh, that's really the basic answer. Otherwise, you're stuck where you are, aren't you? Uh, you certainly are. Yeah. So, but then again, you know, what I suggest to people that are, like, thinking of going to college is forget about it. Uh, that's a huge misallocation of time and money. Instead of spending $100,000 and taking four years of your life to sit around in classrooms and drink beer when you're not. Not that it isn't a lot of fun. I'm not saying that. But rather than spend a hundred grand for that, why don't you spend fifty bucks and get a nice backpack and uh hit the road and start traveling, looking for opportunities. I think uh, you know, that's a, a tougher road to travel, but I think it's a much wiser one. Maybe yeah, I certainly that agree with that. You know, there's no easy way. I think, uh, yeah, that's a good advice, actually. I think um, a lot of younger people would be well served by doing that. I totally agree with you about uh, the education system and taking on all that massive amount of debts just to get a, a yet another pointless degree and then uh, with no job at the end of it. I mean, people should be looking for work, not a job. So, And the w best way to sort of do that is to get life experience, I think. And uh, by going around different parts of the world and seeing, you know, as you said, um, certainly in the Anglosphere, we have certain qualities and things that we could adapt ourselves uh, to different parts of the world and, uh, and perhaps make a go of it there. Um, because, you know, the, the, we don't need any more people in the financial sector, that's for sure. No, and... The other thing is, is that 
when you go off to college for four years, uh, unless you're going to take a hard science, uh, chemistry or physics or something, engineering, something like that, uh, your professors are, are basically a bunch of losers that are going to try to fill your head full of mistaken and even destructive ideas. So I don't see going to college as a, a plus. I see it as a, a minus in just about every way today. Yeah, I agree. It's a shame that we've taken out of uh, the, the young people's market, if you like, sort of the apprenticeship side of it, where people would actually learn on the job and learn things of real value, you know, sort of tool making, woodwork, carpentry, all things like that. Uh, but now sure. they, they learn how to shift paper around and play with computer digits and media studies and things like that. You know, and we don't need any more of that. No, and you can learn all that stuff on your own besides. Exactly. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for those answers. Thanks. And we're back over to Plane for another question for you, Doug. Well, Doug, this is kind of related in a similar theme. Are there any business opportunities that you would recommend to someone who is looking at moving to a new country? Business opportunities. Well, you know, the first thing is, is that when you locate to a new country, all these damn governments want to see your papers so that you can work in the country. They think you're, idiotically, they think you're taking a job away from a local. The best thing to do is to find a business, and this is why the Internet is so wonderful, where you're supplying a good or service over the Internet. Uh, I think that that's the, by far the best single area to, to look at. Uh, that way you don't need to deal with getting your papers in order with the government, and you're not dealing with just the local market, you're dealing with an international market. So that leads me to things like import-export business, uh, various types of the information business. I think that would be the best single place to look today. And I say that as somebody who's not a computer expert by any means, but you don't have to be a computer expert to be able to do these things. You can hire somebody that is. Um, are there any countries that you think are particularly well suited around the world today for, let's say, just as an example, um, I don't know, a 30-year-old uh, ambitious Westerner to, uh, to move to? Well, I wouldn't think of moving to a country necessarily uh, because that implies – becoming a permanent resident and getting into the government's tax system and all this type of thing. I suggest uh, adopting the uh, five flags approach, bank in one country, live in another, have your citizenship in a third, uh, so forth. Uh, but what, where would I go? I'd, I'll go back to what I said before. I think that uh, I would definitely look in Africa because uh, that 30-year-old guy coming from an advanced Western country is going to have experiences, skills, background, connections, uh, and even capital that uh, his competition in Africa won't. And he can probably, if he's, he's got any moxie at all, fit in right at the top of an African society in a very short period of time. So uh, that's what I would do. Well, then that goes into a... Uh... Uh, a whole bigger topic, and that's the whole PT lifestyle, the permanent tourist or perpetual traveler lifestyle, um, as uh, discussed by W.G. Hill. And um, what what trends have you seen in this over the last decade or so? My uh, my observation is that necessary aspects of it are much more of a hassle or demeaning. Examples include the limited length of visas, fingerprinting, naked scanners difficulties as an American in opening a bank account, things like that. So have you got any suggestions as to how to minimize these problems? And do you have any suggestions for getting assets out of the hands of the authorities in Western uh, countries? Well, uh, the specifics of getting assets out of your home country, I, I don't want to go into that in a lot of detail because, for one thing, they have all these laws, many, many more laws than they had years ago, and I'm not interested in accidentally saying something that might violate one of their laws, uh, even though I despise their laws, obviously. 
Um, and of course, it's a nuisance getting visas, but in most countries, you can go certainly 30 days, usually 90 days, sometimes even 180 days on just a tourist visa. And you can have the tourist visa re renewed just by stepping across the border to the next country and coming back again. And I, I think that that's um, a good way to fly. Now, I don't know what these governments all over the world, they're, they're getting, all of them are getting out of control. They're all getting more restrictive and so forth. But uh, I think that that's the way to do it today. Uh, I don't see it as being a big problem. It's not, uh, it's, it's a matter of psychological mindset more than anything else. And I own real estate in several countries around the world. And, uh, you know, when, when I go to these countries, you know, I move into my house, I stay there on my tourist visa, and I leave when, I'm, when, when the weather changes or I'm tired of it or I got business elsewhere. Uh, so I don't have to live in hotel rooms. Uh, although if you have less money, then, you know, you travel with less, you're used to less creature comforts, and you can stay in student hostels or uh, sign up on these websites, which allow you to couch surf in countries where you're trading your, you know, your goodwill and your labor for a place to hang out. And uh, I've never had any trouble at all when I go to a country, if, even if I've never been to a city before. I don't do this anymore, but I used to do it. I open up the yellow pages and start dialing lawyers and real estate people. They're happy to talk to a foreigner. You might have money. And uh, you interview enough of these guys, and eventually you find somebody you like. And I always got, I'd always find somebody say, come on home, have dinner with the family, or oh, there's a party tonight, why don't you come to it? And uh, you meet people, and before you know it, you're sitting down with the president. So uh, these are non-problems. It's a question of your psychological attitude, as far as I'm concerned, M much more than the amount of money that you have in the bank, although that helps a great deal. Uh, so basically, you think the the PT approach is totally viable today, and you would recommend it for a lot of uh, Westerners considering getting out of the under the thumb of the their current uh, government. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I tend to agree. I I, um, I just think that it seems to me, at least, that it's gotten a, a little bit harder in different ways. Um, you know the it used to be you could go from one country in Europe to another, and now you, you know, your visa would be longer. But now it's all part of the EU, just as an example. Well, and yes, I, I, I know, I know. I mean, there's pluses and, and minuses, but uh, you know, I, I, I don't make these rules. I'm just playing the game. Of course. So, of course. you know, just because you, you're dealing with these criminally suppressive governments, you can't let them get you down. You gotta. You got to weave and dodge. You know, uh, that's the big problem that everybody has. They're, they got this beaten down medieval serf mentality. You know, uh, they're 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 afraid to to jump off the plantation, get off the reservation. It's too hard. It's too dangerous. There might be dragons across the hill. Uh, so I mean, what can I say? That's not my approach. Well, a lot of us admire your approach. Okay, thanks, Doug. For our next question, we're going to turn back to Sky Henge. Sky? Thanks, Mac. Doug, this next question I'm asking for Mama Bear. So for the average Joe, what would you recommend that they do to prepare and thrive based on the crashes in other countries that you've uh, studied and watched? Well, I would... Um wait for an opportunity, get your capital together, and jump on it when the crisis comes. Like in Argentina, where I spend a lot of time these days, uh, we bought a lot of land, and uh, we did that shortly after their severe crisis of 2002, uh, when things were at giveaway levels. When I went to New Zealand in 1999, when the, uh, the Kiwi dollar was like 39 cents, uh, we bought a lot of property there at that time. So I think what people ought to do is get in the habit of finding out where bargains are in the world 
and then being willing to transplant themselves. If you do that, uh, you can be really paid for living in a country because if you buy assets there, the assets go up in value by the time you're tired of the place or by the time a better bargain comes along, you sell all that stuff, you make enough money that you are paid for just hanging out there and living high off the hog. So that, that's, that's kind of the way I see it. Uh, it sounds like excellent advice. The problem with that I see with that is that the, the average Joe doesn't have the same successful mindset that you have in that way. And they probably would be staying, I'm, and I'm thinking about for the United States in particular, they plan on staying here. Do you have any specific recommendations if they were to stay in the United States? Oh, that's tough because uh, that's tough. Because uh, with things the way they are, the U.S. government has track of where everybody is and what everybody's doing, and I don't know. It's that's tough. It it, it really is. I, I mean, all I can all I can say is I I pity the poor fool. Well, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> okay, well, what you've said makes total sense to me. Thanks a lot, Doug. Pleasure. Okay, Doug. So as we venture forward under uncertainty, which is about all any of us have here, we'd like to get your views on some possible solutions and outcomes. Um, say now you're that benevolent dictator, and if you could provide prescriptions to cure the ailments of the global economy and the financial system, what would those things be? They're completely unrealistic solutions that I would put forward. I would, uh, first of all, default on all government debt for the reasons that I gave earlier. I'd abolish the central banks, uh, abolish all these regulatory agencies. This is never going to happen, though. It's never going to happen. Uh, it would be too hard. People love their regulatory agencies. They think they're being protected by all these bed bugs in back of desks that are saying what they can and can't do. Uh, get rid of all income taxes. That's never going to happen because people like their welfare benefits. In the United States, they, they like their Medicaid. They like their Medicare. They want their Social Security, which is, just nothing, which is nothing but a, a Ponzi scheme. So, you know, I would uh, totally and absolutely free marketize these places. But then you have all these unemployed government bureaucrats uh, <laughs> You know that uh, you know they'd uh, protest politically, and uh, so uh, I, I'm afraid that uh, you know. Al although I know what I would like to happen, uh, and if I could wave a magic wand, what I would do, it's not go it's not going to happen. So the world is going to have to evolve at its own pace and its own direction. And uh, you know, on the one hand, I'm I'm very optimistic because. Uh, there's two things to remember here. Number one is the reason why the quality of life improves. There are two things. Number one, it's the individual, the average individual out there wants to improve his own situation. I mean, sure, he wants the government to give him all kinds of freebies and he's not averse to theft and so forth. But that said, uh, he knows that he's got to produce more than he consumes and save the difference. Anybody but a complete idiot knows that that's how you become wealthy. And then after you have some savings, then you can look at investment and business and all that. But the average guy, even very simple, intuitive, does try to produce more deconsumes and save the difference. And that means capital is built, and the world as a whole gets wealthier, even though the government's destroying things. If the individual takes care of himself, the world will get wealthier. That's number one. Number two is that uh, there are more scientists and engineers alive today than have lived in all previous history put together. And they're using that knowledge to advance technology. So technology and capital, those two things. And hopefully they'll continue. And so the world will get better. So I'm... Uh, you know, I've got to be a, a long-term optimist, even though the world is going to be going through a uh, some tough times here. 
yeah. mainly okay. because of these governments. But we can't get rid of the governments. That's because people have too many psychological aberrations, and they're too married to things the way they are, even though things the way they are are going to change rapidly. So, you know, that's all I can say. It's a pipe dream to think we can change things. And if Ron Paul was elected president of the United States in November, the first thing that would happen is he would get a visit from uh, the directors of all these Praetorian agencies, and they would tell him, bad things are going to happen to you if you try to make any radical changes. And he wouldn't be able to. The bureaucracy wouldn't let it happen. So it, it, the situation is hopeless from that point of view. That's the bad news. But the good news is the situation is hopeless, but it's not serious. I mean, this is all just an illusion anyway, as far as I'm concerned. Just roll with the punches. Don't, let it, don't, don't worry about it too much. Okay. So since you haven't been assigned that role of benevolent dictator, considering everything that's out there, the risks and rewards, the magnitude and the probability, where do you see the greatest risks and potential? And as the situation evolves, what are the likely largest impacts versus what is the highest probability outcome in your view? Well, you know, it, it can get pretty bad out there, I think. Uh, it can get pretty bad because it's going to be a worldwide situation. Uh, but uh, I always look at the bright side. And the bright side is is that uh, there's going to be lots of distortions created by government intervention. And there's going to be lots of bubbles created as they create trillions more currency units. So... Um, it, even though the general standard of living is going to drop and in a depression, the winner is the person that loses the least, uh, still, it, it will be possible to, to, to maintain and even augment your standard of living. So uh, uh, you just got to keep your eyes open for opportunities. And it's hard to identify what they are right now. It really is. I, I, I think that uh, you can't go wrong continuing to buy gold and silver. I think that's wise. It's prudent. If you don't have any money at all, uh, you know, well, whatever you go to an Indian reservation or take a trip abroad, bring back as many cigarettes as you can. They're going to become more expensive. They're going to tax them more. Same with alcohol. I mean, I'd buy a life if you're looking for a really low dollar investment. I mean, go out and buy a couple thousand dollars worth of ammunition. My my guess is the U.S. government is going to illegalize. Well, if they don't, they won't illegalize it, but they're going to raise taxes on ammunition to the moon because that's an effective way of uh, having gun control without illegalizing guns. So, you know, you buy a bunch of ammunition, and stuff lasts forever. Put it in your basement. It's a great, you know, it's always going to be worth at least what you paid for it, maybe a lot more. So there's things like that to come up. Okay. So if you're currently debt free, would you take on debt? If you currently have debt, would you pay that off? Well, if I owned a house with interest rates at these insanely low levels that they are today, I would take out the biggest mortgage on my house I possibly could. Yes, absolutely, because you can refinance your house now for like, a, I don't know, 3%, 4%. That's a gift. Yeah. If, if you don't have debt, say you're currently debt-free, um, would you sink yourself into that locked-in situation of buying that house if you're well, currently renting? Well, firstly, I don't know. Firstly, oh, uh, firstly you don't own your house. Uh, and I say that because if, if, uh, if you don't pay your real estate taxes for a couple of years, you'll find out who really owns your house. They'll sell it right from out right from under you. So, uh, and, and as far as the house is concerned, I think that, um, the real estate bubble has burst and it's not going to reinflate for years to come. So I, I don't see buying real estate as a, uh, uh, it, it's not, it's no longer something that always goes up. I think it's more likely to go down in real terms in years to come. 
But um, that said, if you currently own real estate, yeah, I'd take out the biggest mortgage you can possibly get at these ridiculously all interest rates. But um, now real estate's uh, not something you can rely on going up. Uh, what you can rely on going up is your real estate taxes and probably your utility bill. Yep. Okay. Okay. Doug, are there any final thoughts, insights, additional things that you would like the listeners to know before we wrap up this interview? Uh, goodness gracious. I think the most important thing that you can do is to engage in a program of, con- other than the things I've already talked about, is to engage in a program of continuing education for yourself. You've got to keep learning and understanding things. And I'm afraid that uh, most people are kind of brain dead. They thought they got an education in college, which they didn't. And now they don't read anything. They don't systematically try to learn any subjects that give them viable, uh, saleable skills. So uh, I, I think that's the most important thing you can do is read a lot of books. There's still libraries out there. You can get the books for free. I think that's number one. But, you know, it takes self-discipline to do that. That and, uh, you know, take care of your body to the best degree you can, men sana and corpore sano, so that you're, uh, you know, you're fit and ready for action when you, when you find something interesting, an opportunity that comes up. That's, uh, that's all you can do. Okay. Well, we very much appreciate it. We've been speaking with author, analyst, and financial researcher Doug Casey of CaseyResearch.com. Thank you, Doug, for sharing your time and thoughts with us today. Well, thanks. It's been a pleasure talking to all of you guys. I appreciate it. The time and events leading up to the summer of 2012 have not been an easy one for investors, speculators, and the average person on the street, as many questions have been raised about the systems as they currently exist. Qui bono, or who benefits, seems to be one of the big questions these days. Seemingly, every week brings new disclosure about corruption manipulation, rigged markets, and all manner of unrepentant foul play in a supposedly free and fair market system. The financial world is filled with perils and opportunities. The risks and threats facing the global economy and the financial markets and our general well-being are greatly influenced by the perceptions, machinations, influences that are often difficult for an experienced and educated professional to fathom, much less the layman and casual observer or the average person contemplating their financial future. We hope that the listeners have gained insights into these topics that we've been discussing today, and we hope that you've enjoyed it as much as we did. If you didn't, look in that Keynesian rearview mirror for the hours and minutes because you're not going to find them back out the front windscreen. On behalf of Fox and all the members of Time Monk Radio, thank you, Doug. We wish you bon chance, and we look forward to new insights as you're able to bring them to us and for those who follow your work. Thanks, Doug. Hasta luego. Good night. Bye, Bye, Doug. Good night. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thanks, Doug. Thanks. 